Well, welcome everybody to the Menlo Midweek Podcast. My name is Mark. We have Aisha on today, as well as Phil Eubank, our lead pastor, as we are talking about the prodigal son. It's in a really great way to see this parable in the story if you're unfamiliar with it, or if you are familiar with it, it feels like we're viewing it through a little bit of a different context. And it's been really fun to dive into that in this episode. And thank you to people like Aisha, people like Rob, who helped record this podcast with us today. We can't do what we do here at Menlo Church without people saying yes to helping out, whether that is online and in this digital ministry or in person. So if this is something that you would say, man, I feel like I want to help bring hope to others, whether that is through the internet or whether that's through greeting people on a Sunday, we'd love to chat. You can text our team at 650-600-0402. And now let's go ahead and jump into today's podcast. Well, welcome everybody to the Menlo Midweek Podcast. My name is Mark. We have Aisha with us today. Hello. And Phil's back. Hello, everybody. <laughs> awesome. We were just talking about returning from travels, some kid stuff that's coming up. Um, I'm going on a vacation too. We didn't get to talk about this. End nice. of the month, Missy and I, my mom and dad, and my brother and sister-in-law are headed to Japan oh, nice. for about a week or so. Amazing. As our last little baby moon yeah, before yeah. this baby's coming in January. Woo! Crazy. Exciting. Uh, yeah. She's probably, I mean, that's like getting close to when they're not going to be super thrilled about Missy flying, right? That's right on the line of the doctor was like, yeah. oh, and we're like, okay. I mean, we've, we've lived there before. Like, we yeah, know yeah. the medical system's good. Sure. We can, if something was to if happen. If something does happen. Yeah. Yeah. But also... Yeah. Feels like rolling the dice a little bit, not in the best way, but it'll be great. It'll be great. It'll be, it's all going to be all fun. the ramen will make up for it. Exactly I know, right. I know. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we're super excited. Awesome. But um, if you are listening to this, we are kind of in a bit of a pickle here. We have someone, Aisha, who likes to get home from a vacation. <laughs> Chill out, not necessarily unpack the suitcase right away. We have Phil get through the door, unpack the suitcase immediately. And I think depending on how the trip went for me, I'm either on Team Aisha or on Team Phil. <laughs> so I would love your comments on this, what team you're on, because we need to, we need to kind of settle this debate a little bit. The only mm-hmm. thing I want to say is yeah. I'm just grateful that my pastor is mm-hmm. the one I know. who's disciplined. <laughs> sure. If you've got to pick Team Phil or <laughs> Team Aisha, yeah. you want the pastor. Okay who okay. plans and sure. who's disciplined mm-hmm. yeah yeah sure, so sure. I, I think it's okay if you well pick and i always Dean feel Phil. like i'm like i'm doing the stuff that my future me is gonna say thank you for right like that's so what in general before we leave for a trip we'll like clean our house mm-hmm. because i'm like i don't really want to do this right now mm-hmm. but i'm gonna want to do it infinitely less mm-hmm. in a week yeah. when i get back mm-hmm. so i'm just gonna do it all now and then yep. when i get back my future self is gonna be like oh thank you so much yes. same thing for me when i'm like oh i have this suitcase Man, I'm going to want to do this less tomorrow than I want to do it right now. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow me is going to be like, oh, we're back to normal. Clean the house, mm-hmm. stuff's put away, let's go. Yeah. so It makes sense, it honestly. Makes sense. Missy and I have that same rule. Yeah. If we leave to travel, for the most part, we got to make sure like the house is generally clean, if not like things are put away, countertops are clear. Yeah. Yeah. And it works great. Like the last time we were traveling uh, was this summer. And the only problem with that was we had a mouse in our house. Oh, dear. So we came back to messes, but a yeah. different kind. So oh, dear. We had left it clean, but ah. it wasn't clean when we got back. Well, I Yikes. just, my cleaning lady comes when, I'm, when I travel. Oh, that's so nice. every time we come back, the house is clean. That's nice. That's a good hack. I need to, I need to do that. It's good. But yep. speaking have of Aisha's in- cleaning lady comes to your house? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I, mean, after yeah, I think we could, have, we could <laughs> okay. make that plan. That's good. Uh, speaking of investments into the future, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Phil, we're in so week good. three. Here we are, mm-hmm. yeah, just a few days away when this releases from actually final commitment weekend. We've yeah. been getting ready for it. Uh, at this point, I mean, for months and months, and then, uh, I mean, as a church, kind of thinking about, praying about, working on this direction for more than a year now. So <clears throat> you're like, are you nervous about? Yes, I am very nervous about the hmm. next few days, but uh, thankful for the work so far and the way that God has used it. And just like the sweetest emails from people about what God is doing in their life as they pray and think about what this looks like. And, you know, for people, maybe at the beginning of the series, they thought, well, I know some people that could really use this kind of hope, uh, but that God is using this in a lot of ways to, I think, challenge people to let hope take up a greater spot in their own life. And that as God does that, 
the way they think about what it might mean for them to bring hope to others is a much more honest expression of God working in them. So uh, it's been great. It's been really good. You know, we've been working through the this tri- this triplet of um, parables from Jesus to mm-hmm. the religious leaders and the the quote unquote sinners. And so this week we uh, landed in the prodigal son's story, uh, and obviously that is a really big story and you may have heard that one kind of in isolation and over the last couple of weeks you realize like oh there was a context and so you know Jesus talks about uh, the lost sheep and a shepherd that would leave the 99 and go after that one and like you know it feels cool and helpful but to understand no 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 that that was a big deal to leave the 99 and pursue the one he's saying there's more uh, rejoicing in heaven over uh, one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous people who don't think they need to. And then the woman who loses a coin and really talking about the joy in heaven over one person being found, that God values them, like we might think about valuing money. And then landing on uh, really this beautiful master storyteller approach from Jesus of first talking about it's, it's, a, it's a father with two sons, a younger son who says, I want my inheritance, which is basically mm-hmm. saying to the dad, because that, just like today, normally happened when the father would pass away, uh, it's basically like saying to dad, I wish you were dead. He mm. takes it, he bounces, he wastes all of the money, uh, and he wasn't like, you know, he wasn't making bad investments in crypto. Like, he was <laughs> wild living, like he was doing crazy mm-hmm. stuff. Um, and then uh, runs out of money, is just trying to survive, has a young Jewish guy, he ends up taking care of pigs and salivating over the pig slop, which like for a young Jewish kid to just be around pigs would have made him ceremonially unclean. And he's like, what am I doing? The text says he uh, came to himself, or some translations say he came to his senses. And then he starts trying to fix it, which is what we all do in that situation. And he's like, all right, I'm going to go, like my, my father's servants get better treatment than this. And so then he mm. practices the speech, goes back, and we get this unbelievable picture of uh, the father waiting, looking down the path, seeing his younger son, mm-hmm. running, meeting him. He starts, like, trying to tell this speech, and the dad's like, get him shoes, get him the rope, get him the ring. Like, he's not a servant. He's my son. Mm. Uh, he's back. My son that was dead is alive. My son that was lost is found. And then the older brother, which this is really for the religious people, it's been a setup the whole time. Jesus just been trying to get to this point. The older brother is, like, in the field, you know, here's the bops coming from the barn for whatever party they're throwing, and he's like, I'm not even going in there for that clown. And the dad, who now has been disrespected by his older son after being humiliated by his younger son, goes to his older son and says, what are you doing? Like, come on. And, and the older, one of the interesting things in the text that I didn't talk about this weekend is the older brother says to his dad, this son of yours that did this, mm-hmm. like he doesn't say my brother. Mm-hmm. And then the father in Jesus' storytelling doesn't refer to him as his son. He refers to him as his brother. Mm-hmm. And so like both of them are trying to be like, man, like don't forget the relational connection that we have together. Mm-hmm. And uh, trying to help the religious leaders understand the people you're discarding are a part of the family. Mm. Like God wants wants to welcome the hopeless home. And so uh, trying to tie that to the inheritance that both of them had been offered. Mm. One wasted it. One tried to earn it. Mm. Uh, and we don't want to do either one of those things. And then tying it back to our own inheritance mm-hmm. individually and collectively as we think about what God's calling us to do as a community. Yeah. Wow. Phil, you've you've been teaching for a long time. How how many times do you think you've used this message and how is this, or this scripture, and how is this one different? Or was it different than other times you've used it in the past? Uh, Yeah, so uh, I've taught this passage many times. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't always get a chance to spend a week at a time on each sub-parable. That's probably just a handful of times. Mm -hmm. So that was fun to be able to like hey, you know, in last week's episode, you know, like Mm -hmm. that's always a fun, like you get to drill down into it more. And Mm -hmm. obviously, as we've talked about, like the initiative and what we're Mm -hmm. trying to do, that stuff has to work its way into messages like these in ways that in a normal sermon you don't do. Um, And then like the first week we had this long explanation video that if you missed it, you can find it at menlo.church slash hope. But that was a seven minute video that basically mm-hmm. had to come out of my talk right. from a time perspective. So then my time got even shorter. Um, and if you're like, oh, boo-hoo. I, when I came to <laughs> Menlo, I pretty typically spoke 
um, yeah, let's call it between 38 and 45 minutes. The most that I ever get to speak at Menlo is about 32 minutes. So when you remove seven minutes from that, that's a pretty dramatic change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you're trying to just figure out like, I mean, I'm, if you saw the way that I edit, I'm literally removing clauses and words to be able to get it into the time that we need it to be. Mm. So then to have this final week in this part of the parable before we uh, do commitment weekend, and really be able to let it breathe. Mm. Uh, a buddy of mine, actually, I was talking to him about the talk, and he put it in the lens of inheritance. I hadn't done that. Hmm. Uh, I had some of it in there, but like he's like, no, no, you should frame the whole talk that way. Uh, I had uh, the problem of like pleasure-seeking versus the problem of performance management, I think, mm -hmm. before I changed it to wasted inheritance or earned inheritance mm. and i think that pivot really let it um i mean it was faithful to the text but I, I think it also really let it pivot uh into the initiative much much easier about this hey we have 150 years of inheritance at menlo mm. individually we have this inheritance of what god has done and what are we going to do with our inheritance are we going to be mm -hmm. the people that waste it uh, or are we going to be the people mm -hmm. that uh, try to earn what we've already been given? Or are we going to say, you know what, we're going to be uh, faithful with mm -hmm. what God really does want to do? And, um, you know, I, I hope um, that as, you know, people hear this and think about it, they really do take a second and go, you know what, um, I want when I look back at my life or when people look at my life one day, this question of what do we do with our inheritance that they say he or she stayed humble, put their hope in God, did good for others. They were so generous. They experienced true life. Like I, I want that to be the way that people talk about me. Um, and I think lines in the same line in the same moments, like the one we're in right now as a community, I think lets us do that. Yeah, definitely. And I heard a lot of your brother's story in this as well. And I know that that has been a recent thing for you. And so did that also kind of change how your, your approach to as you read this? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so, you know, my brother ran away when I was eight and he was 16. I, I grew up in an abusive home and um, he was gone for 15 years. And so we thought, we thought he died. We'd hired private investigators, all that. My dad had a heart attack when I was in grad school. We thought he was going to die. Mm -hmm. Uh the doctors gave him a 50-50 chance to be able to survive one of a series of complication surgeries after triple bypass. He prayed with my mom for like one of the only times at that point in his life that he had prayed with her and said, God, would you just let me know what happened to James? Assuming mm, wow. that uh, really what it was going to mean was like, this is how your son died, was kind of what he expected. Uh, he gets out, he survives the surgery, he's at home. My brother James, at the same time, is uh, under an alias serving a lifetime sentence for international drug trafficking in Vermont, uh, gets out on a technicality at the same time as my dad gets home and he's not on the road because he's recovering from surgery, otherwise he was always on the road. My brother goes to a public library having been released from prison in Vermont and after 15 years looks my parents up, calls my home phone. Wow. My dad picks up the phone. It's crazy. Whoa. Yeah, wow. Crazy. So, uh, so it was like a really, you know, I've always been able to kind of talk about that story, you know, and obviously I've, I've talked about that story because I've, I've lived it. Uh, I think it, you know, it has a, it has a, uh, yeah, like my mom passing away is really, it makes me sad. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's like a legacy that I'm so thankful for. Mm. Uh, my brother passing away makes me more mad more disappointed, I think, because uh, it was so preventable, you know, it was so mm -hmm. avoidable. Mm -hmm. I wasn't battling the battles that he had, and so I want to be kind about that, but uh, I just think he had his whole life in front of him to live, and, um, you know, I think like so many people we have in our life who uh, battle mental health or uh, battle drug addiction, like, they didn't they didn't choose that stuff, um, and at a certain point, it just becomes this thing that, that they can't get free of, and so... Mm -hmm. It, I think it adds uh, a lot more realness. Like, it's not just this happy ending story. Five years ago, it would have been like, oh, my dad's still alive, my brother's still alive. They have this, like, actually pretty surprisingly good relationship. It's kind mm -hmm. of amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it ended a little bit like the story of the prodigal son did, and now they're both gone. And mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, it feels, it hits different, and uh, I just try to to use it in a way that helps people understand, like, uh, this is not just like a text I pick up and read with no emotion. Like yeah. I, I have felt some of these things. Mm. I can relate to the older brother's feelings, even mm -hmm. though I was the youngest brother. Yeah. yeah. 
I think uh, that theme of being the older brother is how I've looked through this passage as well. Ash, I'm curious for you. Are you are you the older sibling? Are you the younger sibling? Are you the middle sibling that's just kind of hanging out? So <laughs> I'm the I'm the this this story of the prodigal son hit me in so many different ways. Mm. So to answer your question, I'm the first daughter. Okay. Um, and I'm married to someone who is number four of five. So we have two very opposite circumstances. Mm. Um, I'm also from a culture that really prioritizes age mm. and gender. Mm-hmm. Mm. So when I was, you know, reflecting over this story, you know, if I step back, I can understand everybody's perspective. I can understand the older sibling's perspective, wow. you know, because as the first daughter, I was trained and because I'm female to be the caretaker, to be in charge, to mm. be the provider, to make sure food is cooked, to make sure everything in the house is going well, make sure your younger sibling, everything. That was my response. I was like the mother before mm. I mm-hmm. became a mom, right? And then I, I look at my husband, who's number four or five, and I can see how you feel like, why does number the first child get to have that position or get that level of respect or seniority, right? Sure. And so there's a little bit of struggle there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's the parent who loves both, right? Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. as a child, you can't really feel that. Mm-hmm. And so what I, what I, you can't feel the equality between the two. And some things are equal, but not equitable, right? Mm-hmm. And I think why this story just hits me so deeply is God's love in a way that transcends any humans, right? Mm -hmm. And that he loves us unconditionally. Mm. First son, last son, son who wasted inheritance, who basically told me, since you're not dying soon, Mm. can I get my share? Um, And then Mm -hmm. wasted all of that money, but as soon as he saw him coming, ran to him. That is, you know, that is the kind of faithful love Mm. that only God can provide. But then I can also see the older sibling having some level of resentment, mm-hmm. right? I get mm-hmm. it from everyone's angle. And I think the beauty of it is just knowing that God transcends all of our individual feelings and he loves us unconditionally. Yeah. Wow. And I think it highlights just how problematic a faith that is not centered on grace becomes, mm-hmm. right? That mm-hmm. in the picture of the story, you have this placeholder of inheritance, but theologically, it's the concept of grace. So you had the religious people mm-hmm. at the time who had hundreds of laws that they were like, we're following all these laws because they were like, there's no grace available. And they didn't understand it. Then on the other side, you had the youngest son who wastes all of this, and now he's got like the plans of what he wants to do with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even the, the quote-unquote sinners that Jesus is talking to, they're all like, we blew it. Like, there's no, there's no way back. You know, even the younger son is like, I'll... I'll just go become a servant. Being a son is off the table. And mm. because grace was actually the centerpiece of the inheritance, he could say, no, 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 younger son, you're still my son. Just because you did something wrong doesn't nullify your identity. Right. Uh, and then to the to the older, he says, uh, j- just because you've been following the rules, like it was never, you, you this entire time have thought you're my son or you get this inheritance because you've been behaving yourself. It was never because of that, you know? Mm. And one of the things that's kind of interesting, you know, you never know how much to tease this out when you teach a text because it's a parable, right? So how much of this contextually are they assuming? How much of it are you reading into the text? But when the father says to the older son, like, you've been with me this whole time. Everything I have is yours. Mm. That wasn't euphemistic. Mm. Like, that was literally everything that I have is yours. Like, you you get your inheritance. You Mm -hmm. stuck around. I'm thankful you did, but, like, it's all yours. And the wild thing about it, if you think about it, is that actually the younger brother ended up blessing the older brother. Because if you think about the way that the apportionment would have taken place at the time, uh, in order to liquidate assets and be able to uh, fund the younger brother... The, the father has to basically say, hey, 50-50 today, here we go. Mm. But it's like compound interest, right? Like the younger son, that's all he's ever getting. Now this and all of this that grows, it's all the older brothers. So actually one-to-one, the older brother should have been thankful that the younger one left. Like if the only thing mm. he was after was money. But he like, 
you just can't see him see that mm-hmm. at all. And the father's like, hey, your your brother's back, man. Like, let's, let's forget about money for a second. Mm-hmm. We thought he was dead and he's alive. Mm-hmm. He was lost and now he's found. Like, let's not forget that. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, Jesus has been telling this mm-hmm. group of people, there's more joy in heaven mm-hmm. over the younger brother that figures this out mm-hmm. than the older brother who doesn't think he needs mm-hmm. to. I like the point you made about proximity to God mm-hmm. it does not mean intimacy. Yeah. Wow. And, yeah. you know, that point, again, hit me because I felt like this idea that we are constantly trying to be Christ-like is actually work, right? You don't wake up and say, okay, I've got all the grace I need, I am completely Christ-like, and it's good. It is every day reminding yourself and working and trying to reach in to get that grace because the grace is there. We just have to take it. And I think for me, I remember when I was pregnant with my second son, I kept worrying. I was like, am I going to be able to love him as much as I love the first? Mm-hmm. Like, it, Because this first kid, the way I love him is so unbelievable. Mm. I could never do that again. And I had the second son and my heart just expanded. And I think wow. when we think about God's love for us, we shouldn't think about it as, okay, there's a pie and he's got to slice it up by 8 billion people. Right? I think he's got 8 billion pies, or however many pies, Mm -hmm. right? Infinite Mm -hmm. number of pies. We can't even begin to fathom the Mm -hmm. size of God's heart and his love. Mm -hmm. And I think once we remember that, Mm -hmm. it changes the way we see the younger sibling, Mm -hmm. right? Because his love for me is the whole pie. Mm -hmm. His love for Phil is the whole pie. Mm -hmm. And his love for you is the whole pie. And part of that love and us being in the identity of someone that wants to also help spread and share that love is somehow trying to transform our thinking of he left, that person left, they're gone to me now to how can I also welcome this person back? Mm. How can I have it on my heart to make decisions, not for me, but so that I can create a space in which the loss can be found. And I just love that as we are going through this series, that's, that's been it. Like that's, that's been the whole through line of this is how can we create spaces and places for people that are not yet found? And I love that we're seeing that in each one of these parables and there's this through line of that. And um, I think Phil, in your message, you, you talked about the permanent campuses that we have Mm -hmm. and the two that we don't have. And you're like, is now the time? Or like, do we need those campuses? And you said, no, we don't need them now. Yeah. But then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the, mm-hmm. you know, it's the question of like, hey, is it really that big of a deal That's if right. we yeah. rent or purchase them? Mm-hmm. And then I think for campuses like Saratoga and Menlo Park, where it's like, hey, yeah, like this thing at our campus could be better, but like it's fine. You know, yeah. like I think mm-hmm. the what can I get away with and what's good enough question sort of percolates in us. And then I think we baptize it in our faith and we mm-hmm. go, well, I just want to be a good steward, you know? Um, and I, I get it. I think those are very sincere questions, but I also think, um, it's so important to be able to recognize we aren't doing this for us. Yes. And so do we need it? No, absolutely. Mm-hmm. We don't, but your neighbor does, your coworker does, your classmate does, your teammate does. Um, and we're not doing it because if we build it, they'll come. We're doing it because we don't want our buildings to be barriers. Every space mm-hmm. makes a statement. And so when you bring that coworker, that teammate, that classmate, that friend, that neighbor, that family member, and you've mm-hmm. like, you've pushed all of your chips in the middle, like you're, rela- you're, you're risking relationship for them to come. Mm-hmm. And I would just say, if you've, never, uh, if you've never thought about how an unchurched person experiences church, I'm guessing you haven't brought one in a while. Because mm-hmm. I'll tell you, when you know an unchurched person that you met and that you love and you want them to know how much God loves them, when you know they're in the room, everything that's weird, like, stands out. It's like when you watch a weird... Mm -hmm. It's like when you watch Mm -hmm. a movie that's kind of inappropriate with your parents (laughs) and you thought when you watched it by yourself, you were like, this is totally fine and normal. And then you watch it with your parents and you're like, I want to light myself on fire. This was a terrible (laughs) idea. You, you, You have that same thing, I think. It's like just a good rhythm to be like, hey, I'm gonna invite my friend to church and then all of a sudden when 
you walk in and the person with all the best of intentions is just immediately hugging them and like, oh man, we're so glad that we're here. We just want to love on you and like insert Christian subcultural phrases Mm -hmm. and uh, you know, like, oh, you don't know what to do at this part of the service and no one is telling you because we all just know what to do or the space that you're dropping your kids off with isn't a Menlo uh, room normally and so it doesn't look like it belongs to the church at all. And they're wondering like, are my kids safe in this room, right? Or they're going like, where's the bathroom? And then you show them a room that's like in the same space as the auditorium, and it's like the size of their bathroom at home, and the toilet's not flushing. Like, all of those spaces are making statements, and the statement, if we're not careful, is this place is for the older brother. If you're the younger brother Mm. and you're trying to figure it out, like, you don't know the script, you don't know Mm. the instructions, Mm. and what it says, whether we want it to or not, is we don't want you here. And so we want every space to say... We thought about you. We built this with you in mind. God loves you, and so do we. And there's a place for you here. Yeah. Wow. The space is for the older brother. How can we make it for that, the younger that, brother? That's deep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's deep. Man. Yeah, so. If every time it has to be, uh, if every time it, there's an instruction sheet that we know that we're not articulating, just be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Acts chapter uh, 15. It's early church. There's a group of people trying to ask uh, Gentile, non-Jewish people who are becoming followers of Jesus to follow all the laws and restrictions, in particular circumcision, which would have been pretty challenging. And uh, they bring it to the Jerusalem Council, and James, the half-brother of Jesus, who was not a follower of Jesus, his brother as his Lord till after Jesus was resurrected, mm-hmm. becomes the leader at the church at Jerusalem. And there's a quote in Acts 15. They say, basically, tell these Gentile Christians to avoid sexual immorality and to watch what they eat are pretty much the two things that they come out with. Not all the other stuff, not circumcision. And then he says this line, and that he translates, we should not make it difficult for Gentiles turning to God. Mm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think today, we don't really think about it as Jews versus Gentiles, but I think in our context, we think church versus unchurch. I think if you, if you mm-hmm. paraphrase that text, we would say we should not make it difficult for unchurched people coming to God. Mm-hmm. And our spaces are a part of that. We should we should want to attract them. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sitting in this chair in this room mm-hmm. because there's 150 years of history right. of investment, of love, of pouring in, mm-hmm. of stewardship, of resources. Mm-hmm. And I want in the next 150 years when I will not be here for there to be far more than there is now. Because mm-hmm. when we talk about hope for everyone... Yes, hope for us at this table, but I want hope for the people who don't believe right now. I want us to be able to reach them, and we have to think about what we need to do to invest so that we can reach them Mm -hmm. in the same way we were reached. I was thinking about that same thing this week. Uh, We've been, we have some amazing footage of like our church being built, and we've played that a couple times during the services, and I've seen it quite a few times, but this time I was like, that person didn't know there was an internet. And yet they still said yes to saying, I want to help build this to what it can become. It didn't know me. It didn't know the ministry that I get to help run. It didn't know the ways in which this church would broadcast this through the sky to other people to watch on their phones, which probably wasn't even a thing then. Yet that person still had the vision to say, I don't care what it looks like. I just want to see. I just want to be faithful. I just want to see this thing through. Yeah. Well, I think it's every generation has said, what does it look like to be faithful with the inheritance that God's given us? We don't we don't want to uh, we don't want to waste it. We're not trying to earn it. We just want to steward it. Mm-hmm. And I think stewarding it in this generation means what does it look like to do this? Right. At one point, that was like tape ministry. You know, where you take oh, yeah. a service and mail it out. Uh, <laughs> it was a. Uh... Overhead projector mini. Right, I remember right. that. Yeah, I do. Yeah. The slides how, you put yeah. on. How smooth can I make this transition? Yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, you know? yeah. uh, as crazy as it is, at one point, stained glass would have been considered oh, technology. Sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That was AVL. That's yeah. what that was. Mm-hmm. What we think about with like screens and lights now, that's what stained glass was. Mm-hmm. At one point, hymnals were technology, right? Mm. And so I think kind of everywhere along the way, you're saying, hey, what's the best possible way we can leverage what we have available today mm. to reach the people of today with the hope of forever. And, um, you know, the, this, this idea that, like, God really is not done welcoming the hopeless home. Uh, I mean, that's been true in my own life. That's been true in my family's life. That's been true in the lives of my friends. Uh, it's been true of so many people through Menlo. And uh, I think as we think about the call that God's placed on us as a community over the next 10 years, 
Uh, we want to be able to leverage the last 150 years and the inheritance of it at Menlo, not only just for like the capital M Menlo, mm -hmm. but for the cause of Christ in the Bay Area, uh, mm -hmm. to be able to see lots of churches get blessed, to be able to see lots of people find the hope of heaven, and to be able to eventually change the world. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Phil, what else from this message before we look ahead to our final weekend? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, asking that question of like, what are you doing with your inheritance and what's the story that people will tell about you? I think that is, it just has kind of like infinite traction in your life. Whether you're thinking about that with your own personal finances, you're thinking about that with the stewardship of uh, God's work and legacy at Menlo, whether you're thinking about the faith maybe that has been invested in you. Like it's, it just is one of those questions that I think if we're really honest about it and we understand the bumpers of, am I wasting it? Am I trying to earn it? Or am I stewarding what God's given me? Um, I think that can be a really helpful diagnostic question that I hope people are processing through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I think asking, you know, the, the secondary question of, um, am I, am I the younger brother or the older brother? Mm -hmm. I think that is helpful. Like it, it humanizes the story, but um, you know, it's, it's interesting to tell this or preach this now. Sometimes you'll ask like, Hey, what would you have preached if you had more time? It's really interesting to tell this story now. Um, our oldest is 15. Uh, you know, and when I would teach this text when I was young, I only saw it through the lens of the sons. It's the only, only framework I had. Hmm. And now I just think about like, what would happen if my oldest was like, hey, give me some money, I'm leaving. And I knew that the long-term investment for his relationship was to do what he's asking or to like, you know, lean in a little bit, uh, knowing that if he comes back, he's really coming back. And then I just think about like, what would happen if he was gone for a while and I heard stuff or I saw stuff on his Instagram and I knew he was making unwise decisions and then one night he like comes through the backyard and I'm like, Oh, I totally get the father now. Like, you're like, of course, I, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, there, he, he, the, the father says to the servants, like get the the best robe. That's probably his robe. Like go mm. get, go get my robe, put it on him. Mm -hmm. And he's like in this pig soaked state. Uh, they probably would have had to throw the robe out afterwards. Right. Um, and I just think now there's this other dimension, like as a dad, mm. uh, 15 years in that I'm going like, I, you know, in Jesus, he he says this in um, in several gospels. He'll say, "If uh, how many of you, if uh, your child wanted something, you'd give them something terrible." Like, and then he says, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, "If you who are human, imperfect, sinful, know how to good give good gifts, how much more will your heavenly Father do for you?" Hmm. And so I think that this is not just about God's heart for unchurched people or church people, religious people, irreligious people. It's about the love of God, even in the brokenness that we are. That's so good. So Phil, as this comes out, this will be on Wednesday. Then we have a couple days until our final weekend. Uh, what, are your, what are your hopes? I mean, many of the people that are probably listening to this podcast probably see this as, they probably see themselves as an older brother. Sure. <laughs> kind of, yeah, kind yeah. of person. Uh, how can we carry this mentality into this week to help prepare for what Sunday will be, really f to celebrate the younger brothers coming back? Mm. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the older brother, if you think about it, like every dime that got spent on that younger brother once he was back in the house, it was money from the older brother. Like yeah. it, it was never, wow. the younger brother had spent it all. Mm. And so every dime that the dad was like, go get that ring. Brother's like, that's my ring. Go get those sandals. Those are my sandals. Everything was going to be the older brothers. Mm. And I think the like gospel perspective is, and it's worth the investment. Mm. Yeah. Like even if the younger, because the, the story is so crazy because you, it's a parable, right? You don't, you don't know. Did the younger brother make stupid boneheaded decisions again? Like my brother, did the younger brother OD in the future? Mm. Uh, we don't know what the older brother did. Uh, but I think like the point of the story is the heart of God and the worthwhile reality of people who are lost being found, people who are dead coming alive again in the hope of heaven for their lives. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been so touching to me. Um, I mean, I've got some really like tearful uh, to read emails over this series of people who are saying, hey, this is my child. This is my grandchild. This is my friend. Mm -hmm. This is my coworker. I'm like, uh, God's waking me up to the call to be able to be a part of them finding Jesus. And I wow. just want to say, 
thank you. And as I think about and give to this, I'm not just praying for this person. I'm praying for other people's this person, other people's grandkids, other people's yeah. kids. It's and so um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm just asking people to pray, to say, God, what does it look like for me to hear you and be faithful, uh, to serve, to really get involved, and to commit financially? And, um, you know, I think even if we don't hit our full uh, funding goal, if, if we have 100% participation, I think God's going to honor that. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to help us move forward as a community uh, to this much larger vision than just doing church. If for you, your faith has become doing church, one of the things I'll say from time to time is doing church, is, it's a terrible hobby. Uh, we're supposed to be the church. We're on a mission. It's easy to mix up Menlo Church from Menlo Country Club. We're Menlo Church. We have a mission. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think this series reminds us of that. That's so good. Well, Phil, thank you. Of course. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should thank you for so much for being on today. Glad to be here, yeah. as always. Rob, thanks so much for helping recording. And everyone else, thanks so much for, for listening. If you have, if you need any prayer encouragement this week, or have any questions, want to share some of those stories as well of people that are on your heart, love to hear them. You can text our team, 650-600-0402. Have a wonderful week, everybody. We'll see you soon. See you.